Now, back in the arcade days of Mortal Kombat, we'd grown so used to the original cast of ninjas, Shaolin, the various Earthrealm defenders and stuff, that the idea of memorable new characters in the 90s might not have been much of a possibility. Now, to be fair, with the release of Mortal Kombat 4, some of the new characters were definitely not as memorable, compared to the likes of Shang Tsung, Scorpion, or Liu Kang, for instance. But one character in particular that certainly was memorable was Quan Chi. A sorcerer from the Netherrealm who was by design supposed to be the most powerful sorcerer in the history of the franchise. Quan Chi had a major part to play in both Mortal Kombat 4 and mythologies, as both games released in a similar time frame and expanded on both the story post-MK3 and even before the events of the first Mortal Kombat. But you know this series by now. We dive into the competitive relevancy of characters and go over each of their playable appearances. And let me tell you, Quan has had a very weird journey. Like some of the others, he's been really good, really bad, and sometimes right in the middle. But he's still a memorable fighter for many. Welcome to a competitive history of the legendary sorcerer, Quan Chi. Okay, let's start with the first game he was ever playable in, which was Mortal Kombat 4. Yes, he was one of the main characters in Mythologies, but you could only play a Sub-Zero in that and it was single player, so <laughs> don't even start. You know, the funny thing is, Quan is possibly the most remembered character in all of MK4 because of all of the funny endings that he appears in. Not to mention all of the mythologies cutscenes and stuff. He's even got arguably the best fatal in the game with the leg beat. Like, this character definitely stands out, right? Unfortunately, not in the competitive space, because for many, Quan Chi shares the bottom of the tier list with Kai, and is very much just not very good. Let's jump into why. Like I've said many times, the punches, kicks, dialer combos, it's all universal in this game, so there's nothing to dive into in particular. However, we can discuss his specials, which is why he's such an underwhelming fighter to begin with. He has a straight projectile, but most projectiles in MK4 are really easy to avoid, so there's nothing to explore there. The Sky Drop makes its first ever appearance, which isn't a terrible move on its own. Anything that can track the opponent tends to be pretty good, and you can use it for ending combos and stuff, but it's very much just a standalone special without extra uses, really. Quan Chi has an air throw, which is pretty decent in classic MK in general, and two more attacks. One is a sliding kick, which isn't good because it's a single hit and doesn't really give him much. And finally, a weapon steal, which will straight up steal the weapon that your opponent is holding on to. A strange moveset overall, which matches his unusual nature anyway, but let's talk about why Quan Chi struggles at a high level. First of all, his weapon is... um... whatever, I guess. It has a launcher on it, but it sends them far away, and overall doesn't do anything impressive compared to the rest of the cast. His bone breaker throw sends the opponent full screen, which sucks because most bone breakers leave the opponent point blank, which leads to rushdown in Mortal Kombat 4. His slide is tragically a far worse version of Tanya's drill kick. His is slower on startup, doesn't go as far, and when it does hit, it just causes a single knockdown. The weapon steal is neat, in theory, and it's a pretty decent move, but it's so easy to remove the weapon from the opponent without having to use this attack that it can feel a bit redundant sometimes. It's very rare that someone has their weapon for the entire round in this game, so the steal unfortunately isn't as much of a game changer as you'd think. Outside of that, Quan's moveset is generally super basic. He doesn't do anything that another character can't do that's worth a damn, and unfortunately, it results in this character being pretty forgotten about by anyone that played this game competitively. He can play MK4, don't get me wrong, but in this game, he is majorly overshadowed by everyone else. Except Kai. Kai also sucks. Sorry. Fast forward in time and we have the next major game in the series, of which Quan has a rather important part to play, as Quan Chi makes up half of the Deadly Alliance. Technically, he is one of the game's boss characters, but only in story. He's a standard selectable fighter just like everyone else, and at the high level of play that this game would bring forward, Quan has often been regarded as pretty good, just outside of the top 10, in fact. A solid mid-tier fighter in a game that has a lot of the cast considered viable, so let's get stuck into his key factors and talk about why. 
I gotta say, first of all, that it is rare to find in-depth character guides for games this old, so I have to shout out testyourmite.com and especially Tom Brady for making a mega thread on loads of characters many years ago. The thread in question was made all the way back in 2007, just to give you an idea, but anyway, this is Quan Chi in Deadly Alliance. First of all, he's a character that is made up of two good stances. The Escrima stance wasn't really used besides the fact that it has power-up as your stance ability and it can branch into weapon. It was in fact Tang Su Do that worked as your hand-to-hand -hand of choice. Tang Su Do is effective for close range with some decent poking potential, and his double broadsword weapon stance is said to be one of the better weapons in the entire game. Skull Projectile is alright, it mostly serves as a full screen check on a taunt or a power up or something, and the damage isn't too bad either, especially when you have power up active. The Rising Leg Kick is the other special, and it's kind of irrelevant this time round. It doesn't work into how you want to play Quan Chi, so this move tends to be ignored in Deadly Alliance. Tang Sudo has a number of effective single buttons that can chain into a bit more for you. 1 and 1-1 one, one are his fast jabs, the down 4 and standing 4 are fast lows, 3-3 three, three on its own is a double kick that has good advantage on hit, and you have stuff like back 1-4 and back 1-3-3 three, three acting as ways to keep the opponent in check, although there's definitely risks involved in those strings. The general idea is that he's got some okay buttons in this stance. More notably, the 1-1 one, one can extend into a full 3-style branch, which is actually the highest damage Quan Chi can get anyway so any substantial punish comes from this branch combo, especially dangerous if you have the power-up. However, power-up isn't all that's there, because Tang Su Do has the counter, which is one of the best stance moves in the entire game. Having power-up and counter together was a very good pull for Quan, as the sheer existence of these attacks can make a character a lot better by itself before we factor in anything else. Broadswords bring the range to the game plan. Many of the attacks here have decent recovery, especially thanks to backdash cancelling, which is a strong technique that's used in Deadly Alliance and Deception, and in general, a fair few attacks can be used to keep the opponent at more than arm's reach. Things like standing 1, down 3, down 2, and standing 3 can all be used to frustrate and keep people away from you. The 3-4 string does really good damage for what it is. Weapons in Deadly Alliance generally have little to go with besides single hits and maybe tiny strings, so having a good weapon is super important. But finally with this, broadswords can use the reversal that Quan Chi has, because it just so happens that the next stance in the order is Tang Su Do. This basically means that an instant stance change into reversal will work the exact same way as if Broadswords just had it by itself. It instantly gave Quan a bit more utility, because the threat of reversal will make the opponent hesitant to constantly go in, and you already have really good keep away thanks to weapon stance. So overall, Quan Chi was a very, very solid character, who sits in that kind of upper mid-tier of the tier list. His stance attacks are very, very good, he's got decent single hitting buttons, an amazing weapon stance, and although he doesn't bring anything out of this world to the table, he definitely has what it takes to play Deadly Alliance at a competent level. Nice. So once again in this video series, we have to visit Armageddon. It had everyone in it, right? So we've got to do it. Thankfully though, Armageddon often redoes a character or adds significant changes to a character to keep things interesting. And let me tell you, with Quan, it's very much the case here. He's completely different and much, much stranger. First of all, he gains new moves, as many characters did in this game. On top of his launching kick and skull projectile that returned from Deadly Alliance, he now has his sky drop back, which is great. In 3D MK, anything that tracks like this is a nice option to have. However, it is the inclusion of the fourth move that really sets him apart from his DA counterpart, which is the Weapon Steel. It shares the same animation as Shang Tsung's Soul Steel, that was a tongue twister, and this move when connected versus an opponent that has their weapon out, note that it doesn't do anything if they're in hand to hand, will permanently disable the use of that weapon until the next round. You can press stance change all you want, but nothing happens besides the sound effect. Now this is unbelievably strong because some characters need their weapon to be viable, and taking it away for the whole round is a total nightmare for them. Imagine someone like Jarek or Shinnok who need their weapon stances to fight you properly and they have awful hand-to-hand -hand stances. They become the worst of the worst if this attack hits them. 
and it also prevents branch combos into weapon 2. So characters that use the weapon branch from hand to hand for their combos now have to do something else. This really is an outrageous move, but thankfully it is just for the one round and you do need weapon out to lose it. So there is a bit of counterplay, I guess. Outside of that, his hand-to-hand -hand and weapon are both changed to focus more on up-close gameplay. Tang Su Do was given to Havoc from Deception onwards, so it's a screamer that Quan gets here. But remember how I said that this stance wasn't great in Deadly Alliance? Well, it has more to offer in Armageddon, so don't worry about that. He gets a fast down one, some decent low kicks in down three, and especially down four, and importantly, just a whole bunch of various combo strings, some of which can branch into weapon stance for a damaging ender. Weapon gets the same treatment, where the super long range hit and run style buttons are mostly gone, but he gains new strings with the broadswords, one of which has a mix up attached. 2 4 and 2 3 back 3 is an attack that goes into either the side slash from standing 4 or a low stab into mid splat. 1 1 4 is a tidy 3 hit, down 1 down 3 is a 2 hit low string, which is pretty much exclusive to Quan here, most characters do not gain extra buttons from a low poke, and the 3 4 returns as it is in Deadly Alliance. There is one pretty major weakness to swords here though, which is the wake up system in Armageddon. You can do attacks off the ground in this game, unless it's a hard set knockdown, but those attacks are uncommon, and a lot of the sword knockdowns that Quan has are pretty minus on hit, and it means that at close range when you knock someone down, they can instantly get up and attack, and you have to be careful not to get hit by it. It isn't always your turn, even after a knockdown. But in general, Quan Chi is more focused on up-close fighting this time over, with more combo potential, his air infinite path with swords is the easiest version, so bigger damage launchers will exist here, he's got some mix-up tools, decent pokes, combo variety, which if people don't know much about him will probably get caught a lot by it, but ultimately, it is the weapon steal that really pushes it over. Quan Chi has no troubles doing good damage, being aggressive and unpredictable, but can take away a core part of somebody's entire game plan if they get hit by weapon steel while the weapon's equipped? I mean, it turns some characters into a sheer unviable mess, which is outrageous. Finally, with that rising kick special that I mentioned earlier, it is way better in this game, because launches are more significant. A launcher in Deadly Alliance didn't really mean much, because you only get a few hits until the combo ends. In Armageddon, a low-profiling, advancing launcher that can go under projectiles, high attacks, and some mids is way more threatening. And due to the different combo system of Armageddon, a launcher from this into one rep of air juggle and a grounded ender can do like 51% damage. That's half their life bar because of a relatively safe, low profiling launcher. Quan Chi, like in Deadly Alliance, is considered by some 3D MK specialists to be in the top 10, or just about. Yes, this game has some god tiers, but the mix ups, the damage, and some might say broken utility of Quan Chi absolutely allows him to compete with most of the cast. He's once again, very, very good. Now, a quick detour before I jump into MK9 and beyond. Now, this hasn't got anything to do with competitive, really, but it's something that I thought was interesting to bring up, and what better time than this video? Had history been different, this video would have included another game in the lineup, and that is the final current 3D MK title, which is Mortal Kombat vs. DC Universe. Look, I don't like this game. It's by far my least favorite MK ever made in the main title lineup, but that doesn't mean it doesn't have a significant place in the whole timeline, because without MKDC, we probably would never have had MK9 and beyond, something covered in detail here on YouTube, so feel free to look into that for yourself. But the reason I'm mentioning it here is because before the big midway crash that caused all titles to cease development or post-launch support, MK vs. DC was supposed to have a little bit of DLC, one of which, confirmed by Ed Boon himself in an interview back then, was Quan Chi, someone we saw in the story, but not in-game. He was supposed to be playable after launch, but midway going bust meant that could no longer happen. Now, I'd have loved to have seen any kind of pre-release footage of how he'd play in that game. How much of his Armageddon moveset would have transferred over, I wonder? Was there any kind of playable version internally? There are so many unanswered questions, but anyway, it wasn't meant to be, so now, let's get stuck into Mortal Kombat 9. Mortal Kombat 9 served as a reboot to the entire franchise. 
working Quan Chi a lot more into the story of all three classic games. Finishing the story with an introduction to Shinnok and what would eventually be the invasion of Earthrealm from Netherrealm's forces in the beginning of MKX. In the game itself, though, Quan tends to be one of the more interesting characters competitively, as his game plan on paper sounds pretty broken, and you'd think he'd be one of the game's better characters because of it. But the thing is, Quan is pretty cheap, sure but he's also not very good. It sounds like those two things go against each other, I know, but hear me out. This is why Quan wasn't considered that viable in this game's meta. Quan Chi has his sky drop and the skull projectile, but he gains a ranged blast with various distances. His now famous trance attack, which stuns for a combo, and this skeletal boost, which will either heal Quan or give him a temporary damage buff. Enhance the boost to give you both. However, if you get hit on block, or hit, it will disappear, which kind of sucks. The X-Ray is your generic MK9 X-Ray, but you'll never see it because meter for this character was far too important for other things to spend on X-Ray. The one major thing people think about with Quan Chi in MK9 is what we know as the Rune Trap. You see, Enhanced Rune Blast is unblockable, and it's plus enough on hit to guarantee something on block. So what you do is land a combo into Trance, jump in with 1-1 one, one Sky Drop, and then loop 2-1-2 two, two Enhanced Rune for as long as you have meter. This does a ton of guaranteed damage, and the vast majority of it is on block, as the Rune allows things to loop. It's a massive damage payout. However, we also would see Quan Chi players try and land more mix-ups afterwards without having to spend everything if the combo won't finish them off. But if the damage threshold is in the right spot, it's a free win if they can't break. Now you'd look at this and already think, how can this character not be good with this kind of damage? But the issue is, this is pretty much all Quan Chi actually has in this game, and it costs all of your meter to do it right, and it's just to win a single round. So that means you can't break her or enhance any other moves if the rune trap is what you save it for. Not having Breaker against characters with the damage of Cyrax, the mix-ups and the pressure of Sonya or Cage, Cabal, Freddy, Kenshi, it's miserable to defend against if you can't use your meter because you're saving it for something else. Well, catch up, what if you don't room trap? Surely there's got to be other stuff there. Not really. He has a low launcher and a single hit overhead that combos into trance if you commit, but the speed of the overhead is so much slower that good players can just block the overhead on reaction. He has an advancing string with a cheeky low in there, but that again is mostly just a knowledge check if someone doesn't know the matchup, and this is years later. His boost is way too slow to be practical, and you don't know which boost you're getting. You can enhance it for both, yeah, but you're losing meter that could be free damage on block for Rune Trap. And like I said, on hit or block, the buff disappears, and it's so slow, it's not really going to last very long. The projectile is pretty underwhelming and basic. Sky Drop is only good if you use it after Trance to set up pressure. The trance on meter burn can actually drain their meter, but again, draining bar is very situational because most of the time you need that meter for rune trap. Now to be fair, Quan's down 2 is one of the best in the game because it's by far one of the fastest and it has a really nice vertical hitbox on it. So at least he has a reliable anti-air if you don't want to risk a standing one or a down one or something. But at the end of the day, Quan Chi without rune trap is extremely underwhelming and with it requires you to save all of your resources, making you more limited than most. However, if the opponent is weak enough, the rune trap will win the round. He's such a strange character, honestly. We do get a good chance to discuss notable Quan Chi players in this video, though, because although he was a weird pick, there were definitely loyal Quan Chi players all around. Players like Shu Jinky Dink from Canada, Insuperable from America, Hidan from Greece, even someone like Under the Mayo, who some of my viewers may now recognize from Doom Eternal and Retro FPS in general. He started here. This is how we know each other. For Quan Chi players, though, there was one small, tiny, really annoying feature. Because back in the day, you had to beat the story mode in its entirety to unlock Quan Chi. Now, if you're at a tournament and the event is using various PS3s or 360s, depending on territory, that are kind of like stock consoles that run every game. Remember, this was during the time of like Marvel vs. Capcom 3, Street Fighter 4 or Street Fighter Cross Tekken. There was a really good chance that that console didn't have Quan Chi ready to go. 
It's no joke when I say that players had to beat the story mode pre-tournament just so they could play as their main character. Shu Jinky Dink infamously had to do this a number of times, and although it's funny to look back on now, this is why a lot of people say that unlockable characters are a tournament nightmare. Quan Chi was cheap as hell if the rune trap beat you, but without it, the character is underwhelming in every sense of the word. He sits in the depths of D tier for most players, sharing his placement with the likes of Noob Cybot, Cyber Sub-Zero, Scorpion, and Nightwolf. These characters needed a lot of help and could not win a tournament by themselves. All right, everyone, it's time to end on a really high note for Quan's competitive journey because it's time for Mortal Kombat X. At no point in this game's life cycle was he ever low tier or even mid tier. He's been really strong the whole way and earlier in the game's day was by far one of the stronger characters that you could pick. And played he was by a lot of people. I'll go over the variations and show you what they do, and I'll try and cover the history of each variation as I go. It's probably the easiest way to go about it here. Quan's universal moves were the Trance, Sky Drop, Rune, and Skull Projectile. Skull Projectile this time round can be done in the air too. The Trance used to give Quan a lot more time to do stuff afterwards, but over time would be shortened for reasons that I'll cover soon. Now you have to meter burn that Trance for the old plus frames you used to have. Sky Drop is his armored attack, but it is notoriously bad, one of the worst defensive tools in the game. But that's because his mix-ups were so scary that he needed bad defense to not be way too over bearing. Rune used to be super plus on block if you meter burned it, but now you have to delay the meter burn to be slightly plus. This move too was heavily toned down. But before I cover the variations, keep in mind that universally in this game, Quan Chi has an unseeable overhead low game. This forward four is his current overhead, but the overhead back in the day belonged to his back two, which went a lot further. Changes aside, he's still a 50-50 machine, even without variations. But with them, oh boy, he's much better. Starting with Warlock, which was by far his least played variation forever, you get a portal grab special which is decent at range and good for ending combos. You meter burn this to restand and be mega plus for your next mix up. You can either take the 50 50 grab, which turns the overall combo into great damage, or you can risk either the meter or your health by just dedicating to it raw overhead low. You get a full screen forward three, which still looks funny even today, and what was, most notably back then, a scoop attack which on meter burn would launch. Now, I say was because this move was Quan Chi's only armored launcher across all variations. However, in the patch that removed most of the armored launchers, this scoop got hit extremely hard. You still have armor with the stab, but its tracking is disastrously poor. This variation was strong back then because Quan in general was strong, and having an armored launcher was kind of ridiculous. But losing the armored launcher made the variation completely irrelevant compared to its far superior other two. Sorcerer next is my personal favorite, and it too saw drastic changes across the game's competitive prime time. You get three spells to cast on the floor. The first, and definitely most common, is the ability to gain a single hit of armor that when procced will regenerate after a few seconds. It's the bread and butter of Sorcerer now, and even was back then when it was new. You can use this for obnoxious armored mix-ups, or you can use it to create a scary zoning game, as any knockdown really will let you set this up. This armor could be manually regenerated in so many ways back in 2015, and even little bits of 2016, but one by one the techniques would be removed for obvious balancing reasons. Now the second is a meter drain spell that's faster startup wise than the other two and it gives your specials meter draining properties. This became the second most used spell in the final patch as this variation saw many changes and the fast speed of the meter spell can be used in a pinch and stuff like that. Finally, and my favorite for sure, was the final hex a spell that increased your chip damage potential. Now, it still works well in the final version of the game, but back in the day, this was beyond broken. It broke so many rules. The old meterless trance had more stun time, so you could set this up for free. Rune meter burn was more plus and no gaps. You essentially had an MK9 style rune trap in the corner, which did even more damage in MKX than MK9. If you got cornered against this back in 2015, the round was over. It was kind of tricky to time, I suppose, but with enough practice was a true touch of death. 
I used this variation before Sector came out and was definitely the most successful player of this variation during my tournament days, getting an EVO top 8 in 2015 and various top 8 placings whenever I actually was able to compete and not just commentating. Nowadays, this variation is all but no more compared to how I used to play the character, but the armor is still extremely powerful indeed and by far the most used way the character is played. The final one is the most common and almost needs no introduction. It's probably the one you've seen the most in tournaments. Summoner. Quan Chi summons a bat that has various attacks attached. And although Quan is different now in the many ways that I've mentioned already, the bat is still incredibly powerful. Quan gains some of the best zoning in the game, huge corner combos, devastating mix-ups that become safe or plus with a late bat release, meterless hit confirms from your 50-50s. The bat gave you everything you needed to play Quan at his dirtiest. There was no joke, a time when almost everyone had a pocket summoner for Pro League seasons, especially with the pre-patch oh, delay-based netcode. Any reactions you could have had went out the window with delay-based online, but thankfully the online would be totally overhauled for Season 3 of Online Pro League. The combination of hard-to-block overhead low sequences, zoning, damage and conversions made Summoner the most reliable pick for most Quan Chi players. We'd see so many of the players, it's impossible to name everyone, but one you're probably the most familiar with from back in the day was Michelangelo. He did super well with the character in the game's prime time, but nowadays you'll see players like Saki putting in the work in the online circuit. Quan is very different compared to 2015, but he's still powerful. His biggest weakness is bad defense, but he needs to have bad defensive options because of all the stuff I've just shown you. Quan Chi in MKX left a significant legacy behind when it comes to just how filthy this character was at a high level. And that's the current competitive journey of Quan Chi. He's been really good, really bad, and somewhere in the middle. I'm going to be honest, I like these kind of episodes because it lets us really see just how different characters are across each installment, and with Quan being such a fan favourite, I hope you enjoyed this one. Now I'm back from Combo Breaker, the regular content can continue. And cheers for sticking with me if you watch the whole thing. Take care everyone, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.